reporting. So this presentation is called uh, Estimates, Expectations, and Evolution. And let's get going. Um, I already did an informal poll of people in this room to kind of get a sense of what you're interested in. Um, I always find that people learn better when they have a purpose, like trying to find something that directly applies to um, their current situation. Um, if you're listening to this purely informational, that's totally fine. But what would be really awesome and what I would love to hear is if there was something that um, was different, unique, um, thought-provoking, that you've never heard before, never heard in that way, and something specifically you're going to take away. Not 20 things, not everything, just what's one thing you can apply. Um, and the reason that I think that's very important is I gave the same talk in Drupal Camp Colorado uh, to a company where they, the now owner, um, they just had someone uh, pass away in the organization that was handling all the biz dev, and it was incredibly stressful, stressful for an engineer now to take on biz dev and project management. And some of the things I've said in here um, were enough to anchor him and change around how he proceeded through RFPs. And he came back to me two months later, he's like, I can't believe that one thing you said was what I latched onto and I changed how I did my RFP process and now I'm saving time in my contracts and, and so forth and so on. So my hope is that there's something in here that may just trigger an idea um, that you could, again, directly use in your business. And um, I'm trying to give this talk, this is my second of, um, second of probably four attempts because I have another camp and then a Drupal Con um, that I'm hoping to present. I still have to wait to see if I get accepted. So if there's any way I can make this information better, more directly applicable to you, uh, please let me know. Um, a quick um, pitch, um, I'm sponsored here through my company, Drud. Um, what we do is we try to build development tools, DevOps systems to help take the complexity of local development through production and try to abstract it away with um, tools like DDEV and so forth. Um, that's the end of the pitch. Come see me if you're interested in sort of uh, adopting Docker-based solutions from your local through hosting. How did I get here? Um, why am I um, maybe qualified or maybe not qualified to give this talk? I actually have no formal project management training, um, but I've had a lot of life that has trained me in different ways, including um, getting through college for 10 years in, in academia, which was incredibly intense. Um, but then I joined an organization where I moved from a back-end developer who never talked to people and just did code all day to what was called a technical project architect, which is sort of, again, that hybrid project manager, developer, biz analyst type role. And then I started to move up the companies. So we grew it from eight to 60 people. Um, I moved completely out of code altogether, and my job was to take repeatable processes that were successful with some of our higher-end Drupal things, uh, sites and replicate that process to multiple teams and then bring on a WordPress division to do that again. So I was trying to systematize those processes. What, what was reasonable? Where did you need flexibility? Where did you uh, need to have more rigidity? Um, where were we failing? Where were we losing money? Where were we succeeding? Um, and eventually, um, we, I left that all together, and now I'm more a product person um, to help companies adopt some of the same tools and workflows that we did to make that company successful and grow. Um, I, no one learns in a vacuum. Um, th this is not a something I invented or s something uniquely special, but I have collected useful pieces from many people in the community and other outside influences that really inspired this talk. I hope that everyone in this room does the same um, and pay it forward. Uh, as, as you know, everyone in this room, all these talks are being recorded, and they're all under some sort of Creative Commons license. But what's the weird thing about the Drupal community is that sometimes people need explicit permission to take something and run with it because they're afraid that, oh, I'm copying somebody, or oh, you know, Seth gave this talk and it was amazing, and I don't want to you know, modify his work because that's either, you know, whatever that is. The, the point is that people take what's useful, merge it with your own knowledge base, learn, merge it with your own processes, bend it to your will, and if it's working for your organization, share that as well. Pass it along, promote it, share it, because something that you say is going to click with someone else and really help them succeed from your experience and your, um, your history. So this talk is all about solving pain, um, because for me, I was, you know, there's a, there's a term called, I think it's baptism by fire, which is um, I joined um, a company in a sort of a turnaround phase, which was, it was a company that was, that's well established, had, you know, uh, over 15 years in the industry, had a lot of big clients, had a lot of big names, had gone through a couple downturns, and I was brought in to basically um, fix things, <laughs> so to speak. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to read books about on project management and, and, and hear articles and so forth of the good times, but it's a totally different thing to take stuff that is 
very intense, very well undefined, um, and everything from high budgets, you know, mis misappropriated uh, timelines, budget sizes, um, you know, turnover, and um, lack of structure. And while it was incredibly stressful, it was incredibly rewarding because through those, um, what I call them wartime experiences, um, where, where little decisions actually can make a huge impact, good and bad, um, again, it really sort of forces you to think very carefully, although and still take action to test things in a rapid way. So, um, and one of the challenges I've also heard from, or had with project management level talks on this topic is there can be this sort of sense that I've figured it out, like that I've gone through this enough times and you know, there's some perfect solution that will work every time for every client, and that's just not true. You know, even in the good times, even when we had processes that I could train 10 project managers on, and we've had that many at one point, um, there are just situations where you're always gonna have outliers, you're always gonna have things that sort of coalesce and become problematic. So, you know, this is not a, a bulletproof strategy, but these are strategies that really increased our probabilities of success across the board, and therefore, I feel very strongly that taking some of these concepts and applying them will benefit you and your organization, or you as an individual if you're running your own shop. And I say this without ego, this is one of the most proud achievements I had in my entire time of professional services was to take this and be able to teach these concepts um, to other project managers um, because it really helped in, in, in many, many ways, which is, um, you know, the, the benefits of this was I could um, improve the you know, upsells of, of projects, and it wasn't about greed, it was about better sizing budgets to expectations. And I was also able to reduce stress on developers. Um, and project managers have a lot more of an, an empowered approach of uh, talking with clients when things went sideways. Because a lot of these things were brought up in the beginning, they were brought up continually through the process, and as a result, it protected the team, which to me is invaluable. Um, I really looked at my team members as, you know, not only just colleagues, but sometimes family, and making sure that we were uh, setting the company up for success and still helping deliver value to the client was very important. And I think the most important one is this middle, is this third tier right here, which is um, this process of the estimator um, turned it from a very sometimes adversarial um, relationship between vendor and client, which is you know you're trying to maximize profit, you're trying to like reduce features to, to harm me, and come at it from a let's work with you with the estimates work, let's show you where um, where you can get more value for your, your money, and it became a much more collaborative process across the board in every project size and in every division in the company. Um, and I also, um, if you came here looking for a checklist, I'm sorry, I can give you some formulas, I can give you some strategies, some shortcuts of how I've worked through the systems, but if you view this purely from a checklist approach, I think that's the wrong way to, to come out of this, this conversation. I hope that the concepts that I go over will give you a different way of looking at things, and if it changes your mindset, and then you would take what you're already doing in your organization and adapt it to that new shift, that to me is the most successful outcome that I can see for you from this talk. So for me, um, just I mean, just to be fully clear what I mean by these three terms, which is everyone looks at estimates as a this, this definitive thing, this, this fixed written in stone uh, item. And, and I've been in enough contract disputes at the end of a project where you know, people can get very legal and very to the letter of the law or to the letter of like what was said you know, seven months ago, two years ago, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of this based around what we all agree is, is an estimation. And for me, um, estimates always have a context, both in terms of the amount of information we have and from what vantage point we're looking at the, the information. And the most important is that time factor because we need to set up um, an expectation with our clients or, or um, internal business units within our organizations and teams about that how that estimation should evolve at each stage of the process, from fuzzy and just high level to very granular and defined at, at the very end. Um, and I'm gonna go through uh, a collection of things that I have found very useful over the years. I hope that one or more of these uh, hits you, you can, you can take something away from this, and when I get to the actual estimator itself, I will refer back to how that concept affects the way that I walk people through that process with my clients. So the first is the concept of lenses. And this is very, very interesting to me because, I mean, 
we already break our website design processes down into certain functions. We have front-end developers, we have back-end developers, we have site builders, we have designers, we have project managers. And everyone is trying to look at a website through their own lens. And just like we are human beings that have that we are a person with a name and we are an experience, um, we are also made up of subsystems that, um, you know, there's the muscle system, there's the skeletal system, there's, you know, all those components. And the same is true um, when we do what's called a discovery or, you know, our planning phase for a site is we're looking at what ultimately the website's going to be, an experience for an end user landing on the site, logging into it, interacting with it, et cetera. And what we try to do in the planning phases is we try to look at it from different lenses, from different points of view. Everything from what's the, what's the layout going to look like? What's a wireframe? What's the user story going to be? What's the actual functionality? What's the value I'm trying to achieve? And how am I trying to achieve it? And then there's things like comps, which is like making it look beautiful, uh, you know, have good vertical rhythms, have good composure, have good fonts, everything else. It matches the, the user stories and, and sort of helps to achieve that result. Um, build specs, like what's the data model behind it? What's the navigation look like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of that whole process, you actually get a website. But um, too many people in organizations, when mine was more backend heavy, we would focus too much more on things like the user stories or the architecture. And we would not necessarily be thinking through the actual experience of a person landing on a page and seeing all those aspects together, which is what is teased out in a wireframe, ultimately in a comp. And, and then also breaking that down to different personas. So it, it's, a, it, it's a sort of an obvious thing to, to, to get to, but if, you know, again, you're a design firm or you're, you're having your back in development, it's critical through this entire process to be able to look at each project through as many different lenses as you can and you have the expertise on. The next topic that I think is a very, very core component is this concept of progressive enhancement. Um, now, that, that, that means something very literal in, in, in uh, website uh, experiences where you actually have functionality that will layer on. And I look at it more in terms of, uh, in the old days of web browsing when an image would start loading and it would start to get more and more clear as the, as the bandwidth picked up. Um, and that's very important. So from each of those perspectives, from the wireframes, which you can sort of very general, like, okay, we're gonna have a navigation, there's gonna be a hero image, blah, 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 down to the, the very, very end of the project where you exactly know where the layout is gonna be, what blocks are gonna be there, why those blocks are gonna be there, et cetera. You're gonna try to get clarity from each lens. But more importantly, every time you, you, you clarify one thing, it's going to impact something else. The more we work you put in wireframes or design, um, helping those designers see how the, the, their, their choices are going to impact the information architecture, the content types, the fields that power that, which are also going to affect the user stories of how an end user and author is going to add content to the system, means that you can now look at it through a holistic lens, ultimately get back to the website while still peering through all the different lenses by which you, you help um, describe the project to the client as you're working through discovery to the development process. Um, I say this, it's, I mean, anyone that's a project manager has probably heard of the project manager triangle, you know, the, the interplay between features, budget, and timeline. Um, obviously, the more features, you know, that affects the budget, the timeline compresses. I'm not going to go into that, but I, I do think it's a core concept that if you haven't um, been exposed to, um, you know, definitely Google it and go through it. And here's, here's one that is absolutely, um, was kind of like such an aha moment for me, and again, it may be so obvious. Uh, to, to developers, but to clients that see websites as voodoo, um, you know, they can, we've, we're inundated with ads like GoDaddy, where you can get hosting for $7, or you can build your Wix site for $5 a month, and all the way to hearing about full-blown million-dollar properties or $10 million websites, and, and for some end users, they look at those different endpoints, and they can't figure out why there's a big cost delta. Why is it that when I I see Commerce Kickstart, I'm like, oh my god, I want to simply test me. I put on Commerce Kickstart, and boom, I have a full look, store looking thing in Drupal in two minutes. And they're like, great, now what you want is going to modify that considerably, and, and by the way, that, that bid's going to be 500 hours. And it's jarring to see so much features and functionality out of the box in five, 10 minutes, and yet so much customization, it's going to cost hundreds of hundreds of hours. Um, one of the, uh, uh, the, the CEO of uh, Wondercop in Europe said, you know, Drupal, uh, features are cheap and details are expensive. 
And the idea is that you know you can turn on a lot of modules and get a lot of you know a lot of way very very quickly. It's the modification of those things, not just at a go in the UI and configure. And that's where I say this this configuration level right here. You know, it's about an order of magnitude. Like you know, take it and then modify it to your liking. Just the UI, great. Add a factor of ten on that stuff. Now at customization, now you want to do custom rule hooks and you want to do certain things and time things out. Now you're done with custom code and boom, you're already at another order of magnitude. And by the way, each feature that an, uh, a client sends you in an RFP can span several orders of magnitude, usually one plus or minus one direction, depending on what they mean by it. So when people get an RFP and they say, I want recurring billing, well, you can do recurring billing recurrently and right. Oh. Yeah. But then all of a sudden you want to do recurring billing with you know refund, with proration, with you know this, this, and hooked into some other uh, physical asset that has to be shipped with a back in office, and boom, you're at 100 hours, 200 hours, 300 hours. And I've been on both ends of that spectrum, and it's it's challenging. But this is important because um, once in, um, I know you're like hell yeah. <laughs> I know this slide. Yeah. I'm gonna use that. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. This one, like to me, was like a game changer because it <laughs> helps surface the voodoo. It's like this is why you know I can't like when someone says I can technically get you e-commerce in five minutes, but that's not what you wanted. And I can technically give you full omni-channel, you know, multiple, you know, you know, uh, you know, read your user cookie from this site and recommend you this. I could do that, but how much value is that also delivering you? Like, if you're only selling three hats a year, <laughs> like, you probably are good at that sucker because the profit of that three hats will probably pay for that five minutes of developer time you're off the races, right? And so it's just a helpful calibration to bring with clients. Um, I'm all about sensitive variables. Oh my God, this is just, uh, I had to help train a five, uh, six person sales team. Um, and what I try to do is when they were getting RFPs and they were getting inbound leads, it was clients will give you this, this list of five to 20 things that they want in the site. And I was trying to give them, what are smell tests? You know, what sort of like, when you see this, you're already out of a 5K range, you're already out of 20K, like you're already looking at something that could be very, very hard. So that way you're not trying to push someone into like a 5K WordPress site, you already can see that this is already ratcheting up those levels of magnitude. So I would, you know, and, and through the estimation process, you know, I would look through things like, every time there's an API integration, unless it's like a turnkey module that you're gonna flip on and it's working, you are already looking at 100 hours. Boom, just, just, just put it up there. Um, and another one that people can get in the trap with all the time is stakeholder size, which is, if you're working directly with a, you know, the startup, of a company and, and it's one individual, they're the, the, the approval, approval person, um, you can work hand in hand with them and that's fine. If you're working for a company like Six Flags and they have 30 people, and by the way, you're two levels away from the CEO who's ultimately gonna overrule everything, you have to be able to, to understand those things are going to come up and that's a strong indicator that you're gonna be biasing up the project and, and you should not be targeting that lower end of those magnitude scales. Um, integrations, because you can never depend on whether those integrations are changing uh, even if they have documented APIs, they'll sometimes change them on you. Um, and that puts, the client doesn't care because they're going through you, but ultimately the site can't work if things, you're, you have dependencies that you can't control. So being able to buffer for those for both learning time in your development teams and also for when things go awry. And then legacy systems, if there's an upgrade, I guarantee you your migration is gonna be harder than you think. You're gonna clean up legacy data. You're gonna have to do a lot of content rework and versus a Greenfield project where you can start from zero content and put it in you have a lot more flexibility there. This one, the guys from Four Kitchen, I, this was kind of like a, you know, the angels came from the sky for me and, and like everything just clicked, which was, I always hated the battle between Waterfall and Agile, right? The whole like, Waterfall, plenty of up front, full documentation, 80 page of everything that's gonna go on, Agile, don't do that, just start building it right now and, and you know, figure it out as you go, deliver value immediately. Nobody has pure Agile, no one hopefully has pure Waterfall, um, but they had such a beautiful way of describing it, which was consultancy scrum. And they, they, they said it like this, um, and it very much matches the UCD system of uh, start, with, you know, start with discovery, start with the widest possible um, you know, brainstorming you can, start to design it, start to kind of give it some shape, define it, get all the back end logic working, and, and go all the way through. And, you're, and so they said, look, there's a certain amount of planning that you kind of have to do up front because very few clients, unless you're a very trusted vendor and you've had a relationship and they just have the, the budget, are going to go pure agile because there's just too much. Because of that variation, the six magnitudes, like that 10K project could be 100K, it could be you know, a million if, if, you know, once you get into it. 
they need to have some assurance. They need to de-risk things a little bit before they're going to usually commit to the whole thing. So there's, there's, there's a need to have a waterfall-like discovery process where you're getting enough to find, call it 80% of that lens. You're sharpening the image to get to that point, and then you stop. Because if you sharpen any further, if you get so much focus on that, you get a 99% pixel perfect cost, you're not allowing the flexibility that's inevitably going to happen in the project, which is people are going to see stuff that more ideas are going to happen, and then they're going to want to change it. So you're trying to find that, that sensitive point, that 80% mark, where you have enough to commit on the budget, because you know kind of like where those order of magnitudes are, and you have enough sort of uh, visibility on the project, you have a good enough sense of what's all going to shape, but you leave enough buffer for the inevitable changes that will happen and, and, the, and so forth. And clients need that flexibility too. They don't believe it, but they need it. Because when something happens, there's going to be ideas, and to say, oh, it's going to be a change order, not going to work. <laughs> and so you go into development, that 20% that flex is where development, you go more agile. You start building on, a, on an agile scrum basis, but you allow the pivot, you deliver to the client on a weekly or every other week basis. And then once you deploy, you go to sport, which is Kanban, right? You know, pull tickets through. You don't have to have like full-blown you know, discoveries, and, and, and you, know, you don't usually have enough work to be at a full sprint, but you kind of go through a pull system. And if you can structure, if you work on a lot of sites, that mindset of, you know, again, sort of define up in, in one of the slides I'll talk about is, um, I don't know why this number exists. 50% of the budget is where discovery should be. I don't know why. It just always seems to work that way. About a seventh of the budget should be part of that waterfall discovery def definition. And then the other six sevenths of the budget becomes, you know, all the way through the uh, development and deploy. If you go too far on one way or the other, you go to like 5% of the budget, you're in more of a pure agile, and it's, there's just not, it's not a firmness of, of, of there. And if you go too far, then you're burning too much of the budget talking, and you're not delivering, and you're ultimately putting risk on the project that way. So again, uh, your mileage may vary in your company. For me, 50% was always what I was targeting as a, as a heuristic. So OK, so OK, good time. Um, so I'm going to be perfectly honest with everyone in this room. I think that this is something that's more of a Hacky training, you know, to, to really go through this and really give you all of the the meat to, to make this work. Um, I've considered making this a Udemy course um, or, or some sort of like video where we can go like literally take a generic RFP and just go step by step and really break it down, you know, through the whole evolution of the project. But I will give you a glimpse of it and, and try to walk through and try to give you enough of a frame of, of how and how it's evolving. Um, again, make your own, make well, whatever makes sense for your business. But um, again, I was incredibly um, excited by this because um, where I was in my company at the time, I would sometimes have 30 minutes to prepare for a call. The RP would land in my inbox and the call was in 30 minutes and we were at the signature stage and I needed to know, is this a 90K project or a 200K project? Can you give me a sense of that? And um, you know, once the adrenaline goes down <laughs> and you know, because you know that the actual risks inherent in that, the risks to the client, the risks to the company. And um, but this was a way to start from that um, low fidelity, but trying to get a pulse of things, and how do I evolve that all the way through when we're ready to start development, and then how do we refine it, refine it all the way through the QA process through deployment? And if you do it right, you can use one spreadsheet the entire time, which is pretty neat when you think about it, because with revision history, if there's ever disputes, um, you can revert back, but more importantly, it, it plants in the mind of the client that there is an evolution of it. You, you're not taking one spreadsheet and that is the source of truth, but that you are working with them at every point of the project, you go back to the sheet and you see it evolve with them. So you're, you're, you're sort of making change a, um, you know, uh, an expectation, <laughs> if you will. So, um, and, and I have to do a better job. I, I had a, a friend that was gonna help me do some of the Photoshopping, but I wanted to sort of describe this before I bring you to the spreadsheet itself, which is this. Um, I had my own parameters, which is I needed to be able to, in the worst case scenario, fill out a spreadsheet in 30 minutes or less that gave me a gut shot. I mean, within plus or minus 25%, so you know, pretty big delta, um, what a project could be just based on the bullet points that I read in RFP. So super fuzzy. But what I'm looking for is I'm looking for rocks. I'm looking for e-commerce, check, big thing. API integration, check, big thing. Um, migration from legacy content, okay, big, big item, right? And I'm just looking for as many rocks as I can and give them that big wide delta for those. So I, so I bound the upper end as high as I can to know like what's my worst case scenario based on these key difficult features. 
And then you basically start working through them. You start taking that high level just buckets and you start breaking them into features. Not user stories, not definitions, not requirements, but just features. And I want to just inventory catalog all those individual things and those become talking points. And then through the discovery process, what you're doing is you're trying to add then acceptance criteria to those. And you're, you're working through and you're helping the client identify when they mistakenly wanted, a, they, they thought they wanted a thousand hour feature and you were able to deliver a feature uh, by you know, doing this slightly and your business doesn't really need it, you could get this 20 hour out of the box with some customization instead of spending a full blown thousand hours. You're working with them as a consultant to save money where they can so they can spend the real money on customization where it matters for their business, where it's unique to them. And that actually is where, again, you get back on the same side of the table and are working with them like a collaborator, a colleague, a consultant versus an adversary. You know, like you said, you want e-commerce, so we just put a hundred dollar line on and we're damn gonna build it because that's what you asked for. So, um, so at each step of the way, you are going back to that spreadsheet. You are refining it with more detail and therefore getting the, the deltas down in terms of like what, what you think it could be. And by the end of that, you could have a pretty good confidence level of where that project could go and that's um, pretty useful. The one other thing that's very important, and this also, um, I know everyone here, or a lot of people here said that they really like the, the six orders of magnitude one. Um, this one to me was a shocker because because a lot of developers don't um, don't really appreciate the amount of overhead that's in the company um, to run a project. You know, PMs are important, and um, a lot of people may think, well, you know, if the developers do most of the project, the PM maybe has like five percent of the time or ten percent of the time on a project, and um, when you really break it down formulaically, um, and I think I have it in the next, yes, cool, cost of doing business. Um, and of course, again, caveat, 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 use your historical data in the company. If you, um, if you have a project where most of it's done by one person, you can reduce the overhead. If you work on projects of a huge size, a lot of stakeholders, um, a lot of changeovers, uh, these values will, will change. But these are just, again, heuristics, uh, um, things that I found historically, but you can get a sense of this. Again, discovery, that whole sort of um, waterfall stage where you kind of get your hands around things, you get kind of the inventory, the features, you get kind of some basic wireframes and, and you get that to a point where you all can thumbs up and say, yes, we're gonna go on with the rest of the project. I always find it was somewhere around 50%. It just, it just was always that case. Um, project management, again, your miles may vary, about 10 to 20% of the project. Just, at, just So if you have a 100K budget, just know that 15K of that is gonna be your PM, period, end of story. And um, in QA, you have both integration QA, or sorry, um, unit QA along the way as you're, as you're deploying features, you're testing them as they go. And at the end of the project, you're doing integration QA. And again, you gotta be looking at that as you know, minimum 10, um, usually 20, and in, in bad cases where things go wrong, I mean, it could be 30, 40, 50, I mean, you could be fixing stuff up at the end in a very bad way. So here's the thing, it's just like the actual building of a project is that the actual people building, you know, site builders, uh, themers and so forth are generally never actually building 50% of that budget, which can be a shocker because when people are in the estimation process, they're thinking so much of the builds that if the budget's 200 hours, they're trying to say, well, all these features, add them up, those features now fall in 200 hours, but yes, if you added all the overheads, did you bound all the boxes and then really get your development down to about 100 hours? Because that's what you have to work with. So this is more of an expectation of the company itself, the vendor, because if you haven't analyzed your business, and, and found out like what your actual production team's percentage of the entire budget is, you're always gonna overestimate because you're always gonna like assume that you're gonna be able to save time in, in PM, assume time you're gonna save these other areas, and it just doesn't happen. Life happens, things get messy, Murphy's Law, and so you need to have that baked into your, um, your, your calculations. So I'm gonna switch over here. Um, this is not readable, <laughs> um, but I will give you a sense of what this is. So. Again, um, I'm going to create a version of this that I can open source and share and do all this other stuff. But um, I would start with a document as simple as this, which is, I would say, you know, what's my hourly rate? How many discovery meetings am I gonna run? How many people am I gonna you know, involve per meeting? How many hours? And so I could take an RFP that, again, could look at like a 30K project, could look like a 500K project. And based on sort of the complexity of what was being asked, I could start to figure out how many discovery meetings. Okay, there's a heavy SEO component. There's a heavy migration component. Okay, that's gonna be a whole meeting. There's gonna be a heavy you know, e-commerce. There's gonna be heavy um, editorial flow. Uh, or it's not, it's gonna be like, it's a very cookie cutter site and there's probably one meeting where I can cover all the things that are noted in the RFP. 
And how many people am I going to have to have involved? Am I going to have to bring my designer and developer in? Am I going to have to bring a UX person in? As it, do I have to bring in two PMs because this is going to be large enough where the client management is going to be challenging? And I basically could dump it into um, a spreadsheet that would auto-calculate based on those values and give me a high-low delta, which I could average and then tie it back to the client's budget. So I could do all this in real time, 30 minutes, and again, gut shot. Accurate? Not at all. But it gave me a sense of, are we even on point? You know, is the client's budget so low that us as an agency and all of our overhead just aren't, it's just not gonna work? Or are we too small of an agency? Like, oh my God, we've never done a 300K project and you know, we're 50 kids are sweet spot. And what I'm seeing here is way, way, way high. So unless we can talk them down to be more of those out of the box features where I can deliver in 10 hours, this is already sort of above our pay grade. We need to be careful here. So the beauty is, so at a gut shot level, and then when a, when a sales rep came to me and said, 30K, is that, is that accurate or is that even reasonable? I could say, okay, 20 to 60K, eh. Around average 40, I might, yeah, the sounds is in the delta, let's go, let's proceed, let's have more conversations in the pre-sales process. If I was more than a, like a factor of two or three from that middle point, not worth our time. We're so far off one way or the other that it's just not worth proceeding. So here's the beauty though. So I can take that document right here and then I can take each of these high level features and then I can put a, what, what I call my one sentence summary. So I would have every project, no matter how complex it was, even sixfives.com, I would say, if I could have boiled down a feature to a one sentence summary, how are my stakeholders gonna know what it means? I'm not gonna go into full blown acceptance criteria, that's for the developers. That's when we wanna get the, the teeth of it and really figure out what the what all the nuances, but like I want them to know that at the end of the day, these 20, these 30, these 40 things are gonna be delivered, and what's a what's a summary that we can all get around to know like when we say that feature, that's a description of it and go. And that process alone can already pull in those numbers. You start editing the high and low, like okay. They really met PayPal buttons. Okay, so I'm on like, you know, I'll, I'll train you how to use the whiskey we got her, drop a PayPal button, it's cool, that's, that's fine. Or I'm on a, you know, recurring billing, with a, okay, can I use Recurly? Because if it's Recurly, I'm gonna be out of the box. Oh, you wanna use a commerce recurring framework because we wanna do something weird. Okay, now I'm, I can pull the low up higher because I know I'm no longer in the Recurly bucket. And so just that one sentence summary can already start to tighten things up and either move the, the average up or down. And as I'm doing that, I'm working with the client in my discovery means, and I can actually be editing the estimate in real time with them. So up on the screen and just go through it with them. Because they can see how their, their choices, you know, in discovery, one of the, the, the issues is that the, all the ideas in the world come out. Like, wouldn't it be awesome if? And like, cool. At, you know, bumped up to 500 hours, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> not, not there yet, but you can, but you can say, like, look, we, we're going to move this, but I just want you to know, like, as we're talking about it, I'm updating it so we can, we can just be real here. We can just say, you know, that's going to be that's going to be why. And then you can ask, well, why is it hard? And then you can have that conversation of, well, there's going to be a lot of back end development. There's going to be a lot of customization. We can't use the, the open source modules. We're going to have to do our own thing. And you're going to have to maintain that. Is this worth maintaining for you, or do you want to use what's out of the box to get you 80 percent there? Cool. That's that's a, that's the the conversation we want to have. Um, and then when you get into discovery, you sort of remove the formulas of this. So you no longer use these these questions as calculations, but you can actually then uh, go here and and start build out your user stories. So that's when you start really getting through that definition phase in, in design. And you could say, by well, recurring billing, I mean this. I mean, a member can sign up, they get a week free trial, they're gonna, the, the shipping thing, I wanna be able to put a tracking code in, blah, 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 blah. And then you, the beauty is like, once you've gone through discovery with your developers, with a client, you can now have a discovery meeting or internal meetings with your internal team to vet the acceptance criteria and then ask the developers before the development starts, kind of start bracketing in those, those uh, hours and really dial them in. All along the way, again, you're sort of, sort of moving that, those averages down and then tightening the, the, the scope. Now your developers are gonna make mistakes, that's fine. But you're gonna, you're gonna be able to at least um, uh, start to move it in the right direction. Here's an, also an interesting thing that I found that was super valuable, which is I always did a green, yellow, red highlighting. And I made it such that um, with Google Spreadsheets or Excel, you can do this really fancy thing where you can sum by um, uh, phase. Phase. Yep. So you can do a, I would have a phase column and I would say one, two, and three, which was in phase, if we have time, and out of phase. And what I would do is I'd make sure the green always tallied up to about 80% of the project budget. Because, again, things happen. I want to have buffer to say, I will guarantee you everything in green because I make sure that those numbers, after we've gone through all this process, is still about, you know, still 20% buffer. And that, would scare people because sometimes those things in yellow were like, ah, I need those, and some things in red, I needed those. But I said the yellow will get to you like, if we do well, and I know people don't like ifs, they want to have guarantees, 
We say, look, we are going to work really hard. We don't want to waste any more time in a, in a waterfall approach by spending all of our time talking. We got, we're at a point now where we have to take the risk to start building. And as a result of that risk, we need to spend more time, which we're going to burn more budget. We're going to turn one of those greens yellow because we're going to keep eating the budget, just discussing and defining and so forth. Or we can start building and there's going to be a little bit of risk factor. Are you okay with that? And if they're not, you can say, okay, then we'll talk more and so forth. But we'll get to a, a thing where we have a definitive what's in green, but you know, there might be less of it. And so if, that, if that's what you need, that's what you need. Um, the beauty here is that this, puts, this empowers the client. It empowers the client because sometimes we think as developers that, that we can identify what's in their green. And often you find the thing in yellow is more important than something that I highlighted is necessary. And then they work with you to say, no, let's, let's move, the, the, move them around. And it also puts the expectation that some things are just in red without a budget increase. And again, it says, I heard you, I heard that great idea. I think it's actually pretty cool, but it's either not gonna deliver enough value or it's gonna be too high a cost. And therefore we, as your, as your partner, as your consultant, put it in red because we don't think, we actually don't think you should do that. And if they disagree, it's like, well, I understand, but let's talk about the budget thing then because even if it's low value in our mind, we respect you enough and, and if you wanna put it in a budget, we need to have a budget increase. And again, it's a very, it may not be an easy conversation, but it's a very um, thoughtful conversation to have. And then if you're really fancy, which we've done on, on several projects, is after, if you use Jira, whatever your ticketing system is, you can now actually put actual time spent. And you could be given clients, like, so, so this could be a risky, you may not want to do this in your organization. We did in several clients and it was helpful because as feature creep or even our own internal um, mistakes happen, we could already be catching as we're delivering the project where the budget's already starting to ramp up. And so, the client is informed in like a two-week cycle about am I on or off course? You know, you guys said the average, you know, is 120 to 140 with an average of 130. You know, that's actually a pretty tight delta. Um, and if we're already seeing like the first four features go over by five hours a piece, uh, we're already eking into that territory where those yellows are going to go away, and it's not a surprise at the end when it all didn't work. So um, it's also really good internally because. Um, Again, enough teams sometimes don't look, they, they kind of get to the end and like, how do we do? And this gives sort of internal feedback. Are, are you on or off course? Do I need to pivot people? Or do I need to internally raise the hand that, oh crap, we're off course. What do we need to do to like either proactively go the client or just know we're gonna have to eat some of that time and that money. Um, so it sounds maybe a lot, but this process of being able to respond to something in 30 minutes to an hour, I mean, very high level, very high delta, find everything you can and get to those first discovery meetings where, well, offline, but it's still here. <laughs> um, those discovery meetings where you start just inventory of all the bullets in their RFP or their wish list, and then you kind of just go to the right where you start to say, okay, as I, as I define it as one sentence, as I refine the criteria and I tighten the numbers, then I have a more accurate picture of what it's gonna be, and as I'm evolving the projects, as I'm building them out, I can see how on or off course I was, and I can use that feedback next time I do a project too, so when a client is trying to, to move a feature, I can go back to that um, six orders of magnitude one and say, here's the, the typical deltas that can be in, in these features. And we know it's from historic data. So we respect you enough that we want to like, kind of show you how the sausage is made and say, these are the bands that, that, that could happen. And we've, we've done this historically and we, we have that information to draw from. So let me get back to presenting after I get this back to a normal size. Your slides be available somewhere? Yeah, I'll, I'll slide share these. Yeah. Um, so, perfect timing. Uh, well, kind of. Um, so, again, if I hope you got anything on this talk, I know I, I tend to try to put too much into one, one slide, uh, one presentation, but you know, there's a couple core concepts where if this is your first introduction to them, things like the project management triangle, I highly recommend you go through them. The, um, the suggested um, uh, you know, people I thanked in the beginning, like uh, Seth Brown from Volibot, phenomenal guy. COO of Volibot, has done some massive projects. He, his writing on project management estimations is also very on point. Um, I find it's not, it didn't really fit my particular meat, which is why I kind of mashed up and pulled some of the aspects from that consultancy scrum. But if you are in this space, I highly recommend you be a student of that space and, and look at some of those resources because for a little, very little amount of time, you can really gain a lot from them. And, and then once you have that mindset, 
you know, take a first stab at it. Take, you know, take the next project you have from, from ground zero. And whether you show this to the client or not, whether you show your team or not, try this process. You know, spend an hour, create your own little spreadsheet, uh, go through it, and see what you like. See if it works. See if you can kind of like parallel, parallel run it to your current processes and see if you learn something about what you do from that, that exercise. And uh, finally, once I'm able to clean it up, this, make it prettier and um, the, the text a little bit more um, uh, generic, um, this, is a, this is a tool that you can take, adapt, or use something of, the, of the, that nature to practically achieve uh, the results that I'm talking about. Um, so that end, that's the end of my uh, formal part of my presentation. And uh, any questions? Yes, sir. I'm just curious your experience. I really like that slide where you were talking about the rocks, the, the big rocks, and the identity. I think it was and the big yep. things that you wanted to focus on. Yep. That really prioritizes what yep. people are expecting. Have you come to a point where, in the process, somewhere where? Other stakeholders come into play, or other decision makers, and they kind of throw things around a little bit, like you were mentioning with different phases. So, yeah. you, and you kind of work with that. Yeah. How do you work with that? So I used a different color for that. Oh, great! <laughs> um, and the reason I did a uh, different color was, again, by sharing the list. And by the way, we didn't just use the spreadsheet. We, you know, we actually had some documents that said, you know, here's your high-level features, here's your criteria in a different way. But internally, that was kind of like our master list. But by going back to the client and said, okay, it's kind of like the um, nonviolent communication style method. Like, I think I heard you say this. I read your RFP and read between the lines, here are the features, you know, the, the both the inventory and one set summaries. Am I missing something? And that's where you're, you're trying to you're trying to um, extract any other rocks that you don't see. And again, you're we're really putting it on them. So between your questions and the discovery process and sort of saying, anything else? Is there anything else? You're, you're really both sides taking responsibility of making sure there's no rocks missed. Any other questions, comments? Yes, Selena. So in my experience, you know, I think 80 to 90 percent of the requirements definition happens at UAT. Yep. So <laughs> <laughs> when they go to click something, they're like, oh, we yeah. didn't tell you about this? No, you didn't. That's oh, what we wanted, yeah. yeah, we didn't tell you about this. <laughs> like, yeah. So how do you deal with that? Like, so, that, that's like, a, come on, we did everything, you know? So so back to the, um, so we've actually, for, for customers that we could identify early on that they, they have some very strict requirements, we physically went through the acceptance criteria with that. Um, one, one, we had a very, very complicated project that was actually running some back-end, um, uh, there's a there's an algorithm that was doing a, a closest hack thing in the back end, and oh God, it's, it's so many things. Um, one of the user stories had 47 acceptance criteria. Like, when I do this, this happens. When I do this, and I was like, okay, we will go through every one of those with you. Um, if you have that level, I mean, because it was a very strict thing, it was very strict tolerances, and if it didn't do it just so, the the product would actually break. So he cared enough to go through that level, and others, it goes back to the whole. Look, at the end of the day, there's a certain amount of time and hours that we're going to spend with you. And if you want to spend that time like really honing on that one feature, you're going to burn all the, like, back to that whole uh, green, yellow, red. If you wanted to make that feature 200 hours, you might be able to get 10 low-hanging fruit features no longer possible because of that. So it's kind of a reminder of like, hey, this feature's creeping up with UAT, and look, this, these other ones are going to have to go now because of that. You can also prioritize um, features that you think are going to be in that bucket, sensitive, that could go up and uh, review them as you deliver them. And if they give you feedback that says, I need to have, no, I, there's more detail here, and you got to do it this way, and then you can go back to the estimator and say, okay, well, here my estimation goes up, and now all of a sudden these other features fall off what's in the budget. And again, you're, you're sort of working with the client as opposed to, and again, it's not always easy conversation to be sometimes still very um, yeah. heated. But you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to be, I'm trying to help you, and by doing that, uh, we, we both missed this. We both missed this detail. So how are we going to proceed? Do you want to keep spending more money to get it exactly the way you want it because it's important to you? Or are you willing to give a little bit to keep those other features in place? Not always easy. And again, I've been in the whole, um, you did it wrong. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm not perfect. And that's part of the whole process is you're not looking for perfection because that's pure waterfall and you're going to burn the budget just talking and trying to find it. And then the other thing yeah. is they keep, like, it keeps happening to me. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm special. You're probably not special. <laughs> um, it's uh, they want a high-level estimate upfront without.
without doing the details, without yep. going through the details. Yep. And then I tell them that, you know, hey, the, the God is in the details, yeah. or, you know, the devil's in the details, but so how, do you, how do you do that? Hmm, that's perfect, actually. And I, this is what I've done. It's like, okay, you have 30 minutes of my, uh, you know, an hour of my time, whatever it is, and you want to, you want to, like, a defined, you know, not to exceed dollar amount. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll say, like, look, this is what was the time I was only committed. I was only committed six hours your RFP, you know, not just going to 30 minutes, but like really going through and reading it in detail, and it could be 30,000, it could be 90,000. Are you comfortable going, you know, knowing that it's probably an average of 60, but it could go higher, it could go lower, are you comfortable enough proceeding? Um, if you need something fixed, then we need to go, you know, full paid engagement to, to find that. Um, of course, customers don't want to do that, but that's where that balance of like, based on our historical data, based on what I've seen thus far, based on what I'm willing to take at risk on my part, you know, how many hours I'm willing to commit before there's a signed contract, um, this is the confidence I can give you, and I'm not willing to go any further. And it's, sometimes they'll call you on it and just say, well, I'm gonna go find someone will. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, if you're doing 20, you know, 10 projects and you have a success rate of 30% close and you've already committed 10 hours, you can do the math of like how much you're willing to commit per project before you know, like, you're losing money. And, and you say, look, I want to deliver you a quality product too, but if you're forced to give me a dollar amount in 10 hours, um, I'm going to probably buffer really high and I'm probably going to skip low. So it's actually, I can't really do you a service uh, by trying to force it into such a small period of time without giving you like either again, high buffer or I have to really cut back the features in order to give you that guarantee. I would rather work with you, you know, through yeah. that consultative process to really give you that high ROI of Avoid features that are too expensive and really focus on and again, it's a whole sales process and it's it's a it's a challenge. Do you do you charge them for the discovery? Yes. Process? We always did, yes. We oh, or, or, or is it a fixed fee or how do you do you, it? Every client is different. Some you can't. Like some people have flat out RPs like there's no discovery. But we've even had clients that had a, a, a mandatory RP process that okay, the RP is for the discovery. And at the end you're gonna get this delivery and it's gonna give you the, all the lenses and stuff. And that whole like you can take it somewhere else if you don't want to work with us, but there was still a delivery. There was still like all the lenses into the project, and that you know de-risks it for clients. Rather than paying the whole budget, I'm only paying about yeah. seven up front to get that. Yeah, good. We've done that. We've, we've broken <laughs> off.